Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of Allure of the Poor, sponsored by Dracina Wines. I'm your host, Lori, a UC Davis winemaking graduate, a WSET level two with distinction graduate, and currently studying um, champagne through the online program. And I am so excited today because I have the opportunity to uh, amazingly through the internet, get be, virtually be able to speak to Clément Perlot, to, um, who is the cellar master for uh, Champagne Pomeray. And Hello, everybody. I'm so excited. So welcome, 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 welcome. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so uh, right before we got on, we're, uh, it is 8 o'clock there, 11 a.m. here. So I'm so happy that we were able to get this going. And uh, I want to start off with, first of all, Champagne is so incredible. It is so distinct. It is so unique. And as everybody who knows, it can only be called Champagne if it's from Champagne. And today we're going to get into the nitty gritty of um, Pomeroy and how uh, you guys are even more special than just other Champagnes that are out there. So, um, Let's start off with the history. Uh, Champagne Pomeroy uh, began when Alexander Lewis Pomeroy began the business in 1836. So you guys have been around for a really long time. And what, ha what was Reims like in those days? And was he one of the first Champagne houses back then? Actually, it was not the first. It was one of the first, but there is uh, some question of, uh, of houses in the 18th century. Uh, for example, uh, our company uh, owns uh, a brand called Eight Sick Monopole, uh, which was founded in 1785. So it's one of the first in the 19th century, but uh, there were some houses in the 18th century. But you have to know that uh, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, Champagne was not uh, a very widespread uh, uh, um, a, a business. Uh, I think we were selling uh, for all the region um, uh, less than 10 million of bottles in, the, in 1850. So it was, was so small at the, at the middle of the 19th century. And I think um, Pomri was one um, of the company uh, which uh, helps the region to develop the business uh, all over the world. And, 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 and yes, uh, to be honest, in 1836, the question of the company was uh, by Narcisse Greno. Um, uh, it is always uh, forgotten, but when you look at, um, at the bottle of Pomri, you see uh, Pomri, of course. And you will see just here, Greno. So uh, in 1836, it was Narcisse Greno. Uh, and uh, in 1856, he, he, he made a joint venture with uh, um, Pomri. And, uh, but at this time, it was really a little, a little company. And uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Mr. Pomri died two years after the joint venture. Um, so at this time, the, the company was selling maybe 30,000 30, bottles. It was very small. Uh, it's really uh, Madame Pomri, the widow Pomri, uh, who developed uh, the company. So what, do you know what, were they originally from the area and they decided to start the Champagne House? Or was this, they traveled to the area in order to start this business? Uh, they, they, they were very close to the Champagne area because they were from uh, the Ardennes. It's a, a little uh, a region uh, near the Belgian border. So it's, it's very close. It's less than, uh, uh, less than uh, 100 kilometers from, uh, from us. So they were very close. And at this time, uh, the business was more um, um, the textile, textile. Um, a business, uh, so they, 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 they made money in, in this uh, business before. So I was going to ask you about that because, uh, you know, when I first went to do some research, uh, you know how Wikipedia always comes up first, you know, and I opened yeah. it and it was like one little paragraph on the Champagne House 
and it said it started as a wool manufacturing company. Yes, yes. And I was like, was, uh, okay, Wikipedia, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Pomoy uh, uh, made uh, his, his fortune in, in wool, yes. Oh, all right, so yay to Wikipedia. Didn't have anything yeah, else, yeah. but <laughs> they had that. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay, so you had mentioned that um, Alexandra Poiré had passed away two years after this joint venture, and Madame Poiré really, she must have been an incredible woman. Like, not only to take on this business, but a brand new business, basically, but she really was, it seemed like to be the heart and soul and the driving force behind the success of this. So like, are there stories, you know, like of what an incredible woman she was or, you know, what else she did? Like, First of all, she, she was very strong because she, uh, his daughter was very young when uh, Mr. Pomery died. She was only 39. Uh, she had to, to take the control of the company at 39 uh, in a time where it was very difficult for women to, uh, to work and, and, and also, obviously to take control of a company. So she was very strong. Um, but there is a, uh, stories of, of widows in Champagne are very strong. There are other widows, but uh, yes, Madame Pomeroy was very strong. And in 1870, uh, France was in, in war. It was uh, so she had to face the war too in Reims. Uh, um, Pomeroy was occupied by the Prussians, so it was a very bad time for her. So yes, she was first of all very strong, and she has. Uh, she was a genius. She has uh, understood everything before everybody. So yes, uh, it's a kind of, uh, of geni geni geni, uh to to know what what people uh, want to drink uh, before the others and uh, how to make uh, sales all over the world. Was she actively involved in the winemaking process? Or was she more business, like this is what we're going to do, or was it a combination of both? She, she was more in, in the sales, but she knows how, how to, uh, she knows what she wanted. And, uh, and uh, she gave a very precise directive to the seller master. So uh, her words were very precise on the style of the champagne. It's, it's, it's still the, the words we're using now, the, the finesse, uh, the elegancy, the, the freshness, and um, she, she 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 gave very precise directive to uh, um, uh, the first seller master um, Damas, and um, the second one uh, created um, the first boat uh, to, because it it take it it took time uh, from the the idea to, of Madame Pomery to the the final. Uh, the final Brut Nature in 1874, uh, because uh, we we started to think uh, on a drier champagne in 1867, I think, uh, when um, uh, his uh, sales director uh, was in the UK and and was feeling that uh, the, the British um, needed uh, drier champagne. So it takes uh, around 10 years to to, to develop and to to make the wine. Okay, um, and one of the things that she was so dead set on was that England was really the place that you had to get to in order to make the the Champagne SP successful. And she was very determined to get there. What was it about England that she felt was so important that you? created the success there and got your wine there. Uh, at this time, you, you know, uh, there were two, two big empires, uh, France, of course, and, 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 and England, because uh, at this time, uh, England made, made the trends. So um, she understood that if uh, the, the English people uh, were happy, uh, she could uh, sell all, all over the world. So. The, the, the British made the trend, so she had to, to 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 go in these directions. And was that? I mean, to me, that seems like that was a a bold, a brazen thing 
for a, a woman to do. But she apparently was very, not only was very, you know, strong, she was also very intelligent because she aligned herself with very uh, good business men. Um, yeah. and they played an important role in this. And um, Henry Vassier and Aldolf Hubenar, if I'm Hubinet, if I'm saying it, probably very. Uh, Henri, Henri, Henri Vanier, Henri Vanier uh, which was uh, the CEO uh, of Madame Pomery, and Ad Adolf Hubinet, the sales uh, director. Uh, but you have to know when she takes the control of the company, uh, Henri Vanier was. Uh, uh, 24 and uh, we've been at 23 or 24 and 23 so but we are very young so she she had the genius to to hire very young people because she she knew that she needed to be very modern and very innovative and it's i think um, with the owner of pomri at uh, uh, currently uh, mr Ronken and, and uh, uh, mr Ronken, uh he, he do a bit the same because he's, he is hiring a lot of young people, young uh, winemakers or engineers. Because uh, as Madame Pomery knows that we, if we want to be innovative, we 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 need to to hire our young people. Too. Yeah, and I mean that's that's true then. That's true today. You can, you know you have to keep staying on top of things. You have to yeah. be new and in and in, in inventive, but innovative, I should say, but with champagne, it's so traditional. So that's got to be a very fine line to walk. Uh, we, we say in French that we are we have the tradition of innovation, and uh, that we are innovative by tradition. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, okay, so the Pomeray Estate is listed actually as a historic state, a historic site. So. I mean, you always see the World Heritage Site, UNESCO World Heritage Site. What actually has to happen in order for a site to be recognized? Uh, actually, it's uh, the, all the, the Champagne region uh, which, has, which is listed uh, on the World Heritage, uh, but um, it's linked to very precise uh, place in Champagne. Uh, it's linked to three uh, to three places: uh, uh, the Champagne Avenue in Epernay, um, the, the historical uh, slopes or coteaux uh, in Ailly uh, and Auville, and above all, not above all, but uh, for us, <laughs> of course, the Butte Saint Nicaise. The Butte Saint Nicaise is where uh, Pomery uh, is. Uh, it's um, it's uh, a hill where you have a um, very uh, uh, extraordinary uh, chalk carries uh, from the Gallo Roman. And um, uh, especially in Pomery, we, we have uh, very particular cellars, um, uh, natural cellars in the chalk, uh, going from all the chalk carries. Uh, we have more than 18 kilometers of, of galleries, uh, 30 meters under, uh, under um, earth. So it's uh, something I think we, we can do now. It's, it was amazing to do that at, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, so that, that was, uh, that's why this place is very uh, particular. And you have on the top the, the estate, uh, very uh, original estate, very big. It's more than 50 uh, hectares. Uh, in acres, uh, I think it's 120 acres. Uh, uh, with a very particular building in uh, in the in a British style. Um, we call this a neo-Elizabethan style. Uh, so it's 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 really uh, a very or original uh, building and and castle. And I mean. I, I feel like I'm, an, uh, I'm stupid for asking this question though, but how, how does one get to be that? Is there a board that comes in and declares this region as a World Heritage Site? Like, uh, it's a very long process. Uh, I think it took uh, 10 years from the beginning of the ID to, to the, the, the listing. Uh, it's, a, it's an official uh, listing from the UNESCO uh, board, yes, of course. Right. So somebody at some point 
basically puts in as a request to be uh, acknowledged and then it's a process that you go through and UNESCO decides yes or no. Yeah, you have to explain why you want to be listed because you have different categories and uh, they, 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 they come to visit uh, the particular places and uh, yes, it's a long, long process. And at the heart of your Champagne House is the vineyard uh, Clos Pompadour of Domaine yes. Pomeray. So what, what is so special about that particular vineyard site? It's very special because it's a, a clos. Uh, a clos in French is a, a vineyard surrounded by walls. Uh, we have more than three kilometers of walls. Uh, it's 25 hectares, so in acres, <laughs> I don't know, uh, maybe 60 acres. Mm -hmm. um, it's the largest clos in Champagne. Uh, uh, it's inside the, the city of France, so it's very particular vineyard. It's a kind of uh, um, biodiversity a garden in the middle of the city. Um, it's in, on the top of the hill, on the top of the Butte saint nicaise so it's only choke. Uh, so the terroir is very particular. Uh, with the, the walls, you have a microclimate. And uh, it's a historical vineyard because we, the first harvest, uh, we, have, we have some evidence of the first harvest in 1896. Um, this vineyard was the property of uh, Henri Vanier, the CEO of Pomery. And he, he crossed uh, World War I, World War II. Uh, during the World War I, uh, it has been bom bombed um, um, and they continue to, to cultivate the vineyard. So it's a very, very strong history. Um, and uh, it's a particular vine too, because uh, most of the vineyard has been uh, replanted in, in the 60s. And at this time, uh, you, there weren't any clones, you know. Uh, so it's uh, what we call a massal selection. So each uh, vine is different from the other, and it's really an historical selection uh, of Pomery. Uh, so yes, we have the terroir, we have the microclimate, we have the vines. Uh, so we try to do a good wine. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is pretty darn, darn special. So going back to the size of it, when, when it was first purchased, did they, was it a smaller site that they've gradually increased or did they purchase this whole region there? You, you mean the Pomeroy estate? Yes. Uh, she, she, she bought all the estate because at this time it was uh, a place where nobody wanted the place because it was uh, <laughs> outside the city with a, a lot of uh, choke carries. Uh, it was just, nobody wanted it. So she, the genius of Madame Pomeroy was to buy this place and make uh, uh, something uh, magnificent. So all of the property is still the original property. Yes, yes, it has wow. been uh, it has been built between 1868 and 1878. Uh, of course, during World War One, it has been part partially uh, destroyed, but uh, it has been uh, rebuilt uh, at the, uh, exactly uh, the same uh, of the original. So for those who have not been lucky enough to visit the, the area, how easy is it for people to get there? And in terms of, of you know, Pare, can they, is it a walk-in? You know, not talking pandemic times. Typically, um, is it walk-in? Is it appointment only? What can they expect if they come to the estate? It's very easy to, to reach us because we are at the, as I told you, we, Pomri at the beginning was outside the city, so now it's inside, but it's uh, uh, at the entrance of France, uh, so it's very easy to, to reach. Uh, we have a big parking, so no problem. You can come by car, by bus, there is no problem. Uh, we have two types of, we have different types of visit. Uh, you can do your, the visit by yourself with your smartphone because you can walk the the galleries with your smartphone and you, we have a, a tour with uh, your, your, your smartphone or you can you can make a, a guided um, visit with uh, with uh, some uh, with a hostess uh, uh, who knows very well uh, uh, the history and the, and the cellar but we have both uh, a visit and you have also um, 
visits with the vineyard, visit with the winery, and you can also uh, visit the, the Villa de Moiselle, uh, which is um, a very one of the, the best examples of uh, new art uh, in France. It's a very nice villa, uh, which was um, the house of Henri Vanier, uh, the CEO of Pomerie. And then when they come in and taste, is it a is it a flight? Is it like how do how do they come in? And what are they tasting? Take us through a tasting. Uh, there, there is a tasting uh, after after each visit, of course. Uh, uh, you can you can taste, of course, the Brut Royal, the Blanc de Blanc. Uh, uh, depending on the tour, depending on the visit, you can you can taste different wines. And how far away, like if they were visiting Pomeray, like can they visit another house afterwards? Like, are you, you know, you're in, you're in the city now, so. Of course you can visit other houses, but like. Uh, <laughs> we don't want to, we want to stay, we want to stay with you. But I'm just saying like, what, if a visitor was coming, what, I'm trying to get them to understand in a day, what should they expect? Like, how yeah. long would your... you? You need you need two hours for Pomerie because uh, if you to do it properly, you need two hours, and uh, you can you can visit the cathedral. There are, there are nice uh, museums uh, in in, in Reims. Uh, and of course, you have uh, uh, our colleagues of uh, other houses uh, close. So yes, you can you can combine with other houses. Uh, okay, but they should expect two hours about with you. Yes, you can. You can do it uh, uh, shorter, of course. Uh, to be, but they're uh, not going to want to leave. Could be <laughs> depending on, on on what you want to see. If you only do um, the cellars, it could be uh, forty five minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you want to do the villa or the, the vineyard or, or the winery, it would it would take. Uh, uh, excellent, excellent. Yes. So, well. uh, you guys actually, I. I totally have believe in pursue your passion, okay? But Madame Pomeroy stated, you might be passionate, but without perfection and discipline, you cannot attain ultimate. So that is a, that is a very high standard to be held to. So what does this motto mean to you as the seller master? Like, what does it mean to you to have this as the ultimatum of how to make the wine for Champagne Pomeray. Yeah, the passion is very is very important, but without uh, discipline and perfection, you you can do nothing. Uh, uh, you have to be committed to to your job and to Pomeray because uh, you are here after uh, a lot of people, a lot of passionate people uh, who created the brand, who developed the brand, and and people will be after you, and you you have a kind of legacy. Uh, so yes, you have to, to have discipline. And you know, uh, in Pomerie, it's from, uh, from the wine grower who, who prunes the vines to uh, uh, the person who put the label. Everybody's very committed to the brand. Uh, and even the wine growers, you know, we, we have our own vineyard. We've also purchased bread from the wine growers. Uh, we have, we have uh, families. Uh, who sells uh, the grapes to Pomery since three or four generations, uh, and they are also committed to the brand and they want to 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 deliver the, the best grapes as possible every year. So yes, and and during the production and the winemaking, you have to be uh, very precise and uh, and of course they are very special. There is a, a kind of art when you do the blend, but it's more a lot of small details that uh, that make uh, a, a grand right so small details are what makes the big differences yes yes so um some of the listeners are new to wine and uh may not understand the actual concept of what is champagne or in this realm just what is a sparkling what makes a sparkling what is the difference between champagne and a still wine. So in a brief overview, can you kind of give us the difference? Like we have a still wine, how do we go from a still wine to a champagne or, or a sparkling wine? What, what makes so, that difference? First of all, to make champagne, you need a still wine. So yes, you have a, 
uh, we we are making a, st a steel wine uh, from the harvest uh, until uh, March April. We are working on the steel wines, uh, what we call vin vin clair in French, vin clair, clear clear wines. Um, um, uh, and after we 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 will do a, what we call a second fermentation uh, inside the bottle. Um, the idea is to, to put yeasts and sugar in the bottle, to close the bottle with a cap, to be very simple. And um, when you you when the yeast uh, ferment the sugar, you have a, a liberation of uh, dioxide, carbon dioxide. And as it's uh, a closed with a cap, uh, all the, the carbon dioxide is uh, uh, in the bottle, and it's. Um, how we created the, the pressure and the bubbles. Uh, so that's uh, really the um, uh, very easy uh, way to explain what a sparkling wine is. And do you, you're riddling, is it by hand or do you have the, what is it, gyric, the machine? I never remember the Ooh. technical term for the machine. The riddling? Oh, as a riddling. Um, we, we, it's uh, traditionally it's by hand, but uh, uh, since a long time we invent a machine to uh, to, uh, to copy uh, what we do with by hand. It's called it's called Giro Palette. So it's uh, it's, it's pages uh, which turn uh, like like when we do with the with the bottle. It it it's the same thing. Uh, the difference is that. Uh, it's more precise. You can do more bottles at the same time, uh, uh, and the riddling is shorter with a machine than uh, by hand. Uh, but it's more easy to do uh, uh, a quarter turn uh, with a machine than by hand. You, when you have to, to riddle uh, fifty thousand bottles, it's <laughs> it's a long yeah. job. Uh, so I think it's a good thing we we have those machines. But we st we are still doing by hand for big bottles, you know, for Mathusalem, um, uh, Salmanazar. It's it's by hand. It would be awesome to see that. That would really be. <laughs> really cool you have to, to come. See. You have to come when when everything <laughs> will be behind us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're not gonna have to twist my arm too hard to to come visit. It's <laughs> really. <laughs> So um, you actually answered the question, you're about 50,000 bottles. I was going to ask how many, what's your production? Um, for Pomerie? Yes. For Pomerie, uh, uh, we, we can talk, well, there is no absolute rule, but we can talk about around 4 million bottles a uh, year. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, when you said 50,000 bottles, I was like, oh, I thought, like, that's tiny. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. At, it's more, but yeah. at a time, you meant really at a time. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And so since the champagne needs the still wine first before it becomes the, the sparkling, do you, does Pomeray uh, produce any still wines or is it a complete uh, champagne house? We we don't we we used to because uh, we we used to to make a lot of different things in Pomerie. Uh, we we made uh, red wines. Uh, we made uh, uh, ratafia from Champagne. We made uh, some uh, what we called fin, which is uh, uh, a brandy, a kind of brandy. Uh, it was in the 70s, but you know brandy are not so trendy, and and uh, and red wines, it's not really the as uh, the the region to make to make wine, so uh, the red wine in Champagne can be very good, uh, but we we stop. We are still making red wine, but only for uh, blending for or rosé wines. Excellent, excellent. And the I thought this was really an in, intriguing fact is Pomerie actually has the distinction of introducing brut, the concept of a brut champagne. And once again, that was Madame Pomery's, you know, understanding yeah. of what the future was to be held. So, like, what did she, what did she notice? What did she see that that created this? And how did how did she determine that it should be a brute or name it a brute? What? 
we, we, we always say that she created the brute. Um, the, the reality is that I think a lot of people uh, was thinking uh, of doing a brute uh, because uh, uh, yes, English people uh, was was asking for drier champagne, but the problem at this time is that sugar was here to hide something. You know, uh, it was in 19th century. Uh, harvest was very tough, uh, less ripeness than now. Um, so the champagne were very acid, very harsh. Uh, so they needed sugar to combine everything and uh, there were a lot of sugar in the wines uh, more than 150 grams per liter it was crazy uh, so yes the idea I think a lot of people uh, was thinking uh, it would be good to have dry champagne so she believed in that and she put everything in line to do it uh, it was very expensive it was very risky so she decided to purchase for example to purchase uh, vineyards, first of all, but also to purchase um, the grapes uh, to the wine growers directly on the vines. So not on the press center, but uh, directly on the vines. That's to say that she, she was uh, taking the risk of the harvest uh, um, uh, for the wine growers. So she, she, could this, she, she could decide when to pick, uh, when it's ripe or not. So it was really uh, very important for her. And what, what was important too, um, the, this estate, this big estate was here, of course, uh, for, to pay homage to the British clients, and, but it was uh, moreover for uh, aging. She needed, she needed place to age. At this time, the wine was in barrels, so she needed place uh, to age in barrels, and she needed place to age in bottles. Because what, uh, what is important is to have ripe grapes uh, for the wine but you need to add the wines in barrels to, to make to make it rounder and you need uh, a long aging in bottles to make it rounder and more complex and less acid uh, so she with uh, 18 kilometers of galleries we can we can store uh, 30 millions of bottles uh, in all cellars and uh, at this time, she, she, she created this, this gallery. She was selling uh, less than two millions of bottles, and she created a, a cellar for thirty millions. So she, she she has in mind that uh, she had in mind that she, to to reach the goal of the brute nature, she needed spaces and she needed to make uh, everything uh, great and very precisely. So uh, she had the idea, but she, more she had uh, the courage, the courage to. To, uh, to make a lot of investments in the buildings uh, and in the, um, the purchasing of, of grapes. Okay, so that's a big difference in, in the quality of the grapes that you could have been using when it was sweeter, right? Versus when you have that dry wine, the, that quality really comes through. And so she yeah. really had to do that. And that, so the term brut is, is she come up with, like, is that French for, like, how did brut come to be the, the name that represents that? Uh, the, the, uh, the term brut was, uh, uh, yeah, really the expression of, uh, of the term dry in English. Uh, the, I, I don't know why, to be honest, uh, but uh, yes, uh, it was, uh, um, when we uh, we uh, we were sh looking for drier champagne, the brut means in French uh, uh, like naked or without oh, okay. any art artifice. It's brut, and and after brut you have nature. Uh, mm -hmm. And Pomery was one of the first house to put nature on the on the label. Uh, nature, nature is is not a trendy word, you know, because we 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 had nature on our bottles in the 19th century. All right. So in the brochure that I was given, it says, uh, whether be the first or 10th, of course, but above all be the Pomeray Champagne Cellar Master. So we, I want to get into a little bit about you now. So what, how did you get into 
the the wine industry how how did you find wine first of all uh, um, i was studying um, agronomy uh, biology uh, at school uh, so i was more interested in in biology and, and agronomy and and step by step because i'm not uh, from a, a wine grower family uh, i wasn't in that, that business uh, but step by step um, with school, uh, I, I I made it narrower uh, from biology to viticulture, and um, I, I studied in Montpellier, which is a quite famous school for uh, for viticulture and enology. Uh, and step by step, yes, passion is was uh, increasing. Um, and I was very linked to my region because I uh, I was born uh, in in the Ardennes, like uh, Mister and Madame Pomery, and uh, very linked to to Rhin. So I knew that if I work in the wine business, I, I wanted to work in the Champagne region. Uh, and I started in the Comité Champagne, which is uh, uh, interprofession uh, of uh, the Champagne region uh, on on technical uh, issues. And uh, in 2004, I, I joined the, the Pomery Group, uh, and Pomery, uh, as vineyard manager. So I started in 2004 as vineyard manager, and, and step by step, I joined the, the testing panel. And, and, and yes. <laughs> so, so you know, so you began by walking through the vineyards yes. and learning the vineyard sites themselves, and the the quintessential what what makes each vineyard it's a, each vine each vineyard its own its own entity and then you just moved up ultimately to being cellar master so when you started in the vineyards did you think you wanted to stay in the vineyards or did you always did you i i, I knew that i wanted to stay in the vineyard and i and i and i, and I keep and kept uh, the vineyard i i have i'm still in charge of the vineyard uh, what was one other uh, part of the deal with Mr. Vanken because uh, uh, you know the, the cellar master is, is chosen by the boss, by the owner of the company because uh, the cellar master is uh, has to incarnate uh, the brand and uh, and it's a way for the owner to to give uh, new orientations uh, to the brand. Uh, so uh, I think my link to the terroir, to the vineyard, my my commitment to environment. Uh, was a uh, key uh, was key to the decision because uh, he wanted somebody uh, he trusts. I was here since 15 years, and uh, somebody uh, involved in the vineyard because it, it's really important for for the brand. We are um, probably the first wine growers in Europe because we we own a lot of vineyard in Champagne in South of France, and um, we we can't imagine making wines without uh, owning our, our vineyard. So. Uh, that makes sense. Okay. And I, I personally think one of the, the best places to figure out what wine you're going to make is by walking the vineyards. You get, yeah, you need to be in course. there on a daily basis, you know, well, especially close to harvest, maybe not, not <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I'm not in the vineyard every day, but like when it's close to harvest, you need to be in there and you need to be- And taste the, and taste the berries. Taste the berries. There's, <laughs> You know, there's all analytics, there's all that you can go send out to the lab to go do it, but I agree, it all comes down to, to the final palette. And I think that it's really cool about champagne is that you're, you're picking this fruit and there's so many steps down the road before you get to making it into your, sparkling into your champagne. Yes. And when you're you have to kind of guess forward or you know predict the next step and where it's going to go because each vintage is so different it's it's you know it's you know the rainfall is different or the sun is different something's yes. different so there is no real formula to making incredible champagne no <laughs> No, but we, we uh, as I told you, uh, there is a part of uh, sens uh, sensibility. Uh, um, 
a part of uh, inspiration, of course, but it can it can be only uh, inspiration and uh, sensibility. We you need tools. You need uh, um, you need you need to have. Uh, it's not formulas, of course, but you have uh, you have a team. You have a strong team uh, with uh, everybody has uh, uh, his role to play. And uh, we have tools in Champagne very strong because we have uh, reserve wines um, and uh, the strong of a uh, house is to have a very uh, rich, very wide collection of reserve wines. And um, you know when there is a bad harvest, uh, you can recognize uh, a great house by uh, uh, a non-vintage uh, during a bad harvest because uh, it's really the, st the strength of the collection of reserve wines uh, that makes the wine. Uh, in, in, uh, for example, in, uh, in 2017, that was a bit difficult in Champagne. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I was, of course, uh, uh, a bit worried, but I knew that I had the collection of reserve wine behind me and that uh, it will be okay. That, um, it all of that, once you get the wine into the cellar, Okay. And you're, you're blending. How, how are you determining, like, what are those blending trials like? They, I mean, it's got to be mind blowing to have, because you're not only tasting this vintage, but you're tasting other vintages and pulling that wine in and saying, I want this amount of this and this and this, where, you know, like for us, we're tasting a single vintage. My blending is barrels. My blending is pulling in different, you know, wines, but they're all this vintage. You're way beyond that. So how how does that even? You you, you need a lot of, of method, uh, and it's a long uh, long way from the harvest to the blend. Uh, you you can't uh, wake up for the, the the morning of the blend and just taste all the uh, bottles. <laughs> Because uh, it's a combination of uh, 100 tanks. Uh, so as you know, it's impossible to taste 100 tanks in the morning and it's a lot of combination. Um, so yes, in the harvest, you, I, me, I need to see the, the grapes, I need to taste the must, the juice. Uh, and it's the first, uh, the first uh, feeling with the harvest. Uh, you have the tasting after the alcoholic fermentation, you have the testing after the malolactic fermentation. You have, uh, after the malolactic fermentation, we start to gather some tanks together uh, with uh, what we have in mind. We, we take a lot of notes, of course. And uh, at the beginning, we just uh, put a note on, on the global quality and um, on, what, on which cuvee you think we, this tank can, can go. And uh, this one can go in the Blanc de Blanc. Uh, this one can go in the Brut Royal. Uh, maybe this one in the Cuvée Louise. Um, uh, Cuvée Louise, to be honest, it's a bit particular because it's, the work is, make, is made uh, before the harvest uh, in the vineyard. But um, yes, and step by step, you gather the tanks uh, um, uh, for Brut Royal, for Apanage, for Blanc de Blanc, uh, in order to, to make it easier during the blend because uh, yes, you need four or five testing to have uh, in mind what what you will do and, and the morning of the blend, uh, it, you need two or three trials maximum because it's uh, for Brut Royale, for example, uh, one trial, it's uh, one hour and a half uh, with uh, 40 bottles on the table. Uh, so you can, you can be, too wrong. You have to <laughs> make two or three trials maximum. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, and you're blending. You have a picture in your head of what this is expected to taste like, right? Because because yeah. it's non-vintage, um, because the majority of them are non-vintage. They're typically the the customer thought process is if I'm buying a bottle in 2020 or I buy a bottle in 2022, they're tasting the same. Yes. Right. So you have this picture in your head and you try to mix and match your lots 
to be honest, we have, we have more than a picture uh, because the particularity of Pomri is uh, to use uh, the blend of the year before uh, in the blend. Uh, in the reserve wines, we have two types of reserve wines. I think it's really particular to Pomri. Um, one half of the reserve wines are uh, separated by variety, but by village, uh, by fraction, cuvée, taille. And uh, one, the other half is uh, the blends. Uh, we keep the blends, uh, we, keep, we keep the Brut Royal, we keep the Blanc de Blanc, we keep the Apanage. Um, one year or two years, for example, for the Brut Royal, we have always two years of Brut Royal uh, of the year before. So in each blend, we, we use the Brut Royal of the year uh, before, uh, for example, if we use 30% of reserve wine, but that's the minimum for Brut Royal, uh, we can put 15% of Brut Royal of the year before. That's uh, an insurance of keeping the style every year. And to have the Brut Royal of the year before uh, to taste during the test, during the blend. So it's very important. That helps, that helps. That helps. All right, so let's talk about the wines I actually have. So the, the first one I have is the Blanc de Blanc. We have the same one. Yes, we have the same one. <laughs> hey, yay, Blanc de Blanc. So tell me about this wine. Now, Blanc de Blanc means from white, right? All white, okay? Yes. So what about, tell us about the production of this wine how you go about where people can find it. Just give me all the love of this bottle. So uh, Blanc de Blanc means uh, only from white varieties. So in Champagne, uh, uh, there are three main varieties uh, covering 99% of the, the area. Only one is, is uh, white, is uh, Chardonnay. Uh, I think you, there is a lot of Chardonnay in California too. Um, but uh, it's a quite rare uh, variety in Champagne. It's less than one third of the, the area, so that that makes uh, the Blanc de Blanc um, um, maybe more delicate to produce because it's, there is not so much Chardonnay in Champagne. Uh, so it's only comes from Chardonnay. Uh, this one uh, is uh, the first um, the first blend, uh, the first cuvee I release as chef de cave. It has been launched in, 19, in 2017, so it's a very a recent cuvee. Uh, and um, we wanted to, um, to, to launch this cuvee uh, and to, to make something particular with this cuvee. Uh, I, I talk about my commitment to environment and to the terroir and to the vineyard. The idea is the, in this uh, cuvee is uh, to talk about terroir and it's a kind of uh, of meeting between different chalky terroir. Uh, there are a lot of blanc de blanc everywhere in the world in Champagne. So the idea is to make something different. Uh, so uh, the difficulty in this blend is to have uh, something very fresh on the nose. Some, we need this for the uh, blanc de blanc. Uh, so some, somebody who, who buys the blanc de blanc wants something fresh on the nose. But um, it's a pommery, it's a, an apanage. Apanage is, is a range in pommery for gastronomy. And so you need a structure in the wine and you need a, a, a length and complexity. Uh, so we work on, on very uh, particular villages, what we call cru, uh, only 10 villages. Uh, from the Côte des Blancs, which is uh, the main region for the Chardonnay, for the Grand Cru Chardonnay. But the majority of the wine uh, is coming from the Montagne de Reims. The Montagne de Reims is a, uh, a hill uh, between Epernay and Reims, where you, you can find uh, uh, the Grand Cru uh, of, of uh, black varieties. They are more famous for Pinot Noir. Uh, for example, Verzenay, uh, uh, Bouzy uh, are very famous for their Pinot Noir. But you can also find some Chardonnay. So the idea is to find a nice Chardonnay on the Montagne de Reims to make something different because the Chardonnay uh, in this region are, are more Pinot-like, so they are more structured. So it's what we want uh, to have more structure, more length in the wine. And the two other terroirs are the secret of the Chardonnay. So, 
I, I have to say I'm a little sad that it, it was 11, that we moved it to 11 a.m. because I was really, was going to be pouring them and, and tasting them. Um, but 11 a.m. four bottles might be, <laughs> might be a little rough <laughs> because I know I'm not going to want to like, you know, save them. I'm going to continue to drink, but it would make for one heck of, one heck of a Wednesday afternoon. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, so we have our next label is a Brut Royale. So it is now a Brut uh, label. To, to, to answer you, I think uh, it, has been, it has been launched very recently in the, in, uh, in the USA. So uh, maybe not easy to, to find uh, in California, but it will come very soon. Yep. Brut Royale. Brut Royale. So Brut Royale is uh, um, the iconic cuvee uh, of Pomerie, the, the flagship uh, okay. of uh, Pomerie. is uh, the cuvee you can find everywhere in the world. Um, it's, uh, I would say, um, the key to enter the world of Pomerie. Uh, um, a lot of houses and Pomerie is, is famous for their prestige cuvee, the cuvee Louise. But uh, what is more difficult and what is very important is to achieve uh, the non-vintage uh, because everywhere in the world you will find uh, the blue label uh, from Tokyo to New York to San Francisco. Uh, it has to be the same every year. Uh, so yes, it's really the, uh, the key to enter the world of Pomerie. So it has to be perfect. Uh, and it's really the modern vision of, uh, of the Brut of 1874. Uh, really what Madame Pomery wanted, it's a Brut Royale. Um, so uh, very fresh, very elegant. Uh, so it's a selection of 40 villages. So it, you have more villages because we want a blend of, uh, uh, of what Champagne can offer. Uh, it's a historical villages. Uh, of Pomerie, uh, from all vineyards of, of uh, wine growers. Uh, it's one third of each variety, one third of Chardonnay, one third of Pinot Noir, one third of Meunier. And the idea is to find all the components of the three varieties, but uh, we, without uh, any uh, um, too much differences, we want really harmony in the wine, yes. So, so it's a really a wine for aperitif. Uh, uh, it's dedicated to aperitif, but uh, you can pair it with food too. Uh, but uh, the idea is to make a very, very nice, very fresh wine for aperitif. Okay, so it's a lighter wine, and this is this is the wine that they would most easily be able to find. Yes, obviously yes. Now, I'm so intrigued because again, going back to champagne can only be made and can be called or made in champagne. Pomeray also makes California sparkling, okay? yes. And the thing that when, when I was first contacted, that really is what blew me away is, is this concept because champagne is so strict in, or at least to my thought process, it is so strict. I mean, you can only, you can only have your vines trained in one of four different ways. You have to, train, you know, you have to pick on a certain, you know, in a certain range. You can only bottle on a certain day. You, you know, all of this stuff is so regulated. And here in California, I mean, I mean, for the most part, it's, it's, you know, guns a blazing. We can do whatever we want. You know, there's laws, but you know, I mean, mm. even you're drinking a Cab Franc, you know, that's, it doesn't mean it's all Cap Franc, right? It could be. Right? <laughs> so I, the rules, I'm so curious as to how the production of a sparkling wine in California from an actual champagne house, you know, there's, how do you feel about the differences? And I know that you can make it in the traditional method and all of that. And, you know, people say that, oh, this is, but you guys are a true champagne house making wine in California. So what, is, what do you see as the differences, whether they're easier or harder? Uh, the, um, the Louis Pomerie, I have a bottle, I think, yeah. The, the, the Louis Pomerie um, um, is a, a global project for the brand um, because it, uh, it's a product in California and uh, a project in California and in the UK. Uh, 
at the same time. Okay. Um, it's really uh, a quest of, uh, of Chardonnay in the world. Um, Pomri was uh, trying to be in California in the 70s, uh, but uh, it doesn't work. So well, it's a comeback for us in California. Um, and uh, of course, there is not so much regulations. But uh, as a uh, champagne house, you know, we are uh, using our own rules and specifications. So, um, but we are free to do it. But so that's the difference. We are free to do it, and um, but we are we are applying the, quite the same uh, uh, the same rules. Uh, uh, we are working also on a blend of different terroirs. That's uh, the idea. But uh, it's really a quest for Chardonnays. Uh, we are more working on, on Chardonnay in California. Uh, uh, we, we, it's almost blanc de blanc. We are, um, if you are talking about regulation, we, we, we could have said that it's a blanc de blanc, but uh, as there is a 5% five, five of Pinot Noir, we, it's not a blanc de blanc for, for us, but we could have said it's a blanc de blanc. Um, uh, so yes, it's really a very precise specification from the harvest to to the end, uh, but we, as it's a, a new product, a new a new project, we can try different things we we wouldn't have tried maybe in Champagne. Uh, for example, we 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 have uh, tried new way to to make the second fermentation, the Prise de Mousse with a uh, encapsulated yeast. Um, so we we are doing it uh, in the UK, in California. It's a uh, it's also a way for us to new things uh you know did um so is this production the where is this actually produced like uh, in uh in so in uh, sonoma valley uh you know, we, we used to have um, uh, a partner we, we just changed the partner but uh, yes uh the, the the project is uh for not we have uh, we are purchasing grapes from wine growers and uh, we we are um, we are using uh, facilities um, to custom custom crush contract uh, because uh, we, we we are taking time to to think on what we want to do. Uh, but the idea is to to, to apply your specification uh, uh, here in, um, in Sonoma Napa Valley. Yes. And is the goal to so you're saying this is a new venture? What do you know when this started? In uh, 2015. 2015. Okay, so it is still really new. Um, yeah. is, is the goal to eventually have a house here in California? Where, of course, we think about it. Yeah, um, we in, in the UK, the product is different because we. We start by by purchasing the vineyard and, uh, and making a winery. Uh, it's of course um, maybe more difficult here in, in California, and we it's not the same project exactly. And uh, I, I, as we did in the UK, the idea is to try to make our blend uh, best knowing the terroir, the different terroir. It's, 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 it's a bit complex in California too. Uh, we have, there are a lot of different terroir, and uh, we have to know better um, the terroir too, and uh, to, to know exactly where we want to go. Uh, we are exploring a lot of, uh, of things at this time. And is the winemaker here in California? Is he from? Is he from? The winemaker is uh, the cellar master of Pomerie, so. Uh, it used to be uh, Thierry Gasco, uh, the former, uh, the ninth cellar master of Pomerie. Uh, we work it together. He, he, he launched uh, Louis Pomerie in California, and he, he, he just uh, gave me the, uh, the transition uh, this year. So uh, the idea is to have uh, a team in Reims. Uh, uh, I have a project manager for the sparkling wine, a winemaker. Uh, uh, and we have also a uh, French engineer in, in, in the UK, in, in, the UK, in, uh, in New York, uh, and who is doing uh, uh, the travel to San Francisco uh, when, uh, for the, the key stages. Very cool. And have you, got, have you been able to come here? Not yet. Not yet? <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. 
Like, uh, of uh, course, I, I know California, but uh, not since we, we launched, uh, and, uh, because of the COVID, uh, it's very difficult, <laughs> it's impossible to come, of course. Right, right. So, the how did you choose your vineyard sites? Did people come over here and review the vineyards? And yes. decide, and do you have long-term contracts? Oh, that, with that, that was uh, that, what was Thierry Gasco, uh, uh, and we took, we, I took with him, um, and yes, it's really the um, there is no no rule, no in French we say a priori. Uh, of course, uh, you can imagine Napa is better than uh, another uh, place, but uh, that was really uh, by testing, and uh, uh, we we don't have uh, any. Uh, uh, pre ideas of uh, what uh, we we have to purchase, so um, we we choose uh, some chard very nice chardonnay in the low dye region. So it depends really on the taste and uh, the idea is to mix the terroir to have uh, cooler regions and uh, maybe uh, a more uh, um, more hot uh, chardonnay from the low dye. So the idea is to mix really uh, uh, different chardonnay. Very cool. And what about our last bottle, the the rosé? Yes. So again, so this is, is another California. It is a brut, but it's a brut rosé. Yes, it's only two weeks. Uh, it has been released only two weeks ago. Oh wow! Um, yeah, yes. Uh, so it's really the, the new the new one. Uh, it's a blend, uh, as we do in Champagne. Um, uh, it's really a rosé in the uh, with the, um, the Pomery style, uh, a very, a very pale uh, salmon pink uh, rosé, uh, uh, because we we want we wanted a rosé uh, in which the Chardonnay is the dominating. Uh, we we want uh, elegancy, freshness, uh, and with a lot of uh, um, with nice notes of uh, red berries, of course, but. Uh, uh, we don't want the red wine to be too much present in the wine, so that's why we are using very small quantities of, of red wine to, to have this very elegant color and uh, this elegant aroma. And so, in terms of in terms of choosing California for these, uh, you said that you're in UK. Are is there? Was there a reason why you chose California? Just because, you know, I mean, they can, you can make it in, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, I think California is the best wine region there is, but, <laughs> but um, one, of know, the best. Is, one of the best. <laughs> <laughs> in the United States, but there's Oregon, there's Washington, DC, like, did, why California? Is there a relation, like the, the relation in terms of what the fruit is like? In Champagne versus these areas, uh, we 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 of course we uh, Pomery was in the in the trend of the 70s with the other house uh, French houses uh, in California, uh, so we knew that the region was uh, good for sparkling wines, and uh, we we know that uh, our, our colleagues from uh, other houses are making uh, uh, nice Champagne, nice uh, sparkling wines. Uh, here in California, uh, it's not champagnes anymore. The sparkling wines. <laughs> now, actually, um, can you, because you are a champagne house, is the, is there a gray area there because you are a true champagne house? But or did you by you had to stick to that rule, that law also, because you are calling it California. You are not calling it champagne. You're calling it California. No, no, but no. We 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 uh, we can't. Uh, there's no gray uh, area. We can't say champagne; it's forbidden. Uh, there is, yes, it's a bit difficult with um, the USA, but uh, uh, as a French house, it's, <laughs> we can't say champagne or, or, or champagne method. So uh, yes, it's traditional method. Uh, uh, yes, it's very important because uh, if we don't say uh, <laughs> sparkling wine, it would be uh, a shame. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. You know, sometimes. Sometimes there's a little grandfather clause, there's a little gray area. Um, mm. But my guess is that Pomeroy would like, even if you could have, it would you would want it to be a distinction. You you know it needs it. There. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes, it's 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 uh, it's really Louis Pomery, so uh, it's, it yeah. was a way to pay to pay homage to the founder because, uh, as I told you, he, he died uh, two years after the creation, yeah. and so uh, we know very well uh, Madame Pomery, so it was a way to pay homage to the Madame. founder uh, for a new project, uh, and it's uh, yes, it's not it's something different. There is no comparison with champagne. It's way to make. Uh, sparkling wine, uh, which express the terroir of the region. So uh, we we don't want to make champagne in in the UK. We want to make a sparkling wine from Hampshire uh, with the terroir of Hampshire, and we do we want to do the same in California. Excellent. Uh, and we we want to express the terroir, but with the the style of Pomery. Yes, that's the idea. So I have one last question about regulations and things because this kind of always like gnaws at me a little. So even though champagne allows seven different grape varieties in champagne, right? You, it's really only three. Yeah. Why, why are there the other four? Do, was it used to be? Were they more prevalent at some point? Do they add well, something? They, they, uh, they have been forgotten. Uh, some are a bit planted, like uh, Pinot Blanc, uh, White Pinot, or Grey Pinot, Pinot Gris. You, you can find some uh, in the Côte des Bars, for example. Uh, Arban and Petit Mélier are, are more difficult to find. Um, uh, we have the collection of the seven varieties in the, in the Clos Pompadour. We, you, you can find, uh, you, uh, you have the seven, but it's very very uh, small plots, but uh, the idea is to, to keep uh, uh, the memory of these uh, varieties, but uh, who knows, because with the global warming and everything is changing, so we are very careful to these old varieties, uh, because there were maybe two acids at one point, uh, but maybe in 10 years, 20 years, these varieties will, will save us, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> true. See, that's true. You've got to always be looking towards the future. You don't know. Uh, we have to. We have to keep the memory and and test from time to time. I think there are interesting things in the in those varieties. Um, uh, for example, uh, I planted some Pinot Gris in the UK to, to try. So um, I think Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir, and Meunier are, are so great that it's difficult to to replace them. Uh, but it's a part of history and uh, of patrimony, so we have to keep them and, and see uh, what happens in the future. Excellent. Um, all right, well, did I miss anything? Do, is there something that you feel that that we should know about about Madame Pomeray or about Champagne Pomeray, about you, anything? Um, what can to do is it's a better uh, way to, to discover Pomery is to, to come to see us um, because um, the estate is uh, amazing, the vineyards, and uh, it's the uh, same thing for all our products. Uh, if you have uh, any possibilities to visit our vineyard in South of France or Rosé wines in Provence or in Camargue or Port wines uh, or Duo wines uh, in Portugal, uh, I think. For all products, you you need to see also and to because there is a lot of passion, a lot of work behind uh, all the bottles, and it's very difficult with words to to express how committed we are to uh, to our products. And yes, come and visit us. I hope uh, the virus will let us uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> free to do it uh, in the future. Uh, but yes, it's very important to. Communicate on 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 our vineyard and on the work we do in in our vineyard, uh, because the wine is uh, is passion. It's uh, it's also conviviality and uh, yeah, behind the label you have a uh, patrimony story. You have uh, a lot of things. Thank you. All right, so I lied. I have one more question. Savoring. Have you done it? Is it a true? You know? Do you think that it's it's you know? Uh, us Americans kind of goofing around, or is it, you know, something traditional? I, I, I know it's tradition. I, did, I didn't get the word. Excuse oh, me. savor to savor. Uh, the savoring, bottle. savoring, the savoring the bottle. Uh, I'm not very uh, fan of it because uh, uh, 
there is no reason because it's it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Uh, we, we 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 used to do it with. Uh, if you if if you visit us, uh, it's it's a uh, it's a nice experience to to saber in the cellars or or to saber a club on Pado in the club on Pado. It's uh, it's very it's very fun. Uh, but I am I'm always. Um, uh, uh, Separated between the respect to the bottle and, and the fun uh, of, of the of uh, <laughs> the jest. <laughs> well, I I love to saber so much that my yeah. husband bought me an actual saber. Um, I think he got with, with the glass. Yes, I have used a glass. Um, <laughs> I think he bought me the saber because he's tired of me trying to find different things around the house. You know, I've used a stapler. I've, like I've used like <laughs> if I can grab it, I tried it. Um, a spoon. A spoon? I have not a used a spoon. No. I have not you used have to try it. <laughs> okay, I will try. I've seen that's been kind of trending a bit, and that I don't understand. That have you seen the videos? They take, they have it, and then they click, 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 and then they go, and I don't know why they're clicking. Um, I think there's no interest in. Just, they just. Uh, they saw uh, something. Yeah, else. A, a way to be more confident in the. Oh, okay. <laughs> It, it, it's really, uh, it's really uh, uh, kind of fragility in the glass uh, 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 between the seam and the, the junction of uh, of the neck, and it, it should go very easily. Uh, if everything goes okay, it should should, should go without uh, right. knocking on the on the bottom. Like, mm. I um, I actually do really love it. And, but I will only do it to bottles that I'm willing to potentially lose. Yeah. Um, Cause I have had a fail. I have had, I've had two fails. Um, and then- It can happen. It, 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 it not, it's not a problem with, uh, it's very rare, but it, it, can, it can fail. But uh, yes, it depends on the just, bottle, more, more on the bottle than on you. <laughs> I think it was more that I was a little too um, excited to drink it, and I don't think I let it get cold enough. Um, but because yeah, it kind of yeah. just, it just kind of exploded, like here, like it really exploded. Uh, yes, um, yes, yes. So I, I didn't let it get cold enough. But see, I would be, I would, I wouldn't savor this because I would be afraid that if I messed it up and it exploded, I wouldn't be able to enjoy it. So yeah, I pretty you much. Can, you can, you can, if it. If it's well done, it should be okay. You will, you won't lose any any wine. <laughs> all right, all right. Twist my arm. I'll have to do it for. I'll have to do it for Instagram for for when I drink this. Okay. Um, but it it really is a lot of fun. Um, and th there was a sidebar this morning. I watched the video. I don't know what they were talking about, but he was. It wasn't. It wasn't champagne. It was just a really bad cheap wine that they didn't have a bottle opener for, and they were blow torching down here. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? What is the concept of that? And then the whole bottle exploded. I was like, all right, you deserved that. Um, but that wasn't savoring. That was just pure stupidity. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening and out of what is, I'm sure, your very busy day to talk to me about, about Champagne Pomeroy. And um, where can people find you? Where Where is the best place if they want to contact Pomeroy? Um. Uh, I think uh, I'm not the best person for uh, to, to talk about sales in, in, in California, but I think you you can find it in K and L wine mer merchants, uh, oh, okay. bo bottle barn, uh, wine wine dot com, and, and Bevmo and Rayleigh's. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> those the are good. Is, is, is okay. <laughs> yep, those are good. Those are good. And do you know are you are you on social media? Uh, yeah, we we are on Instagram, uh, of course, and, and Facebook. Maybe you can find from me on Instagram. But, uh, okay. No problem. All right. So when I save her, I will be sure to tag you guys. <laughs> yes. It would be my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Enjoy your the rest of your evening. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge, and I cannot wait to taste these um, these champagnes. I'm. And like I said, I'm, I'm studying champagne now, so I'm so happy to have these in front of me. So thank you. Thank you very much. It was very, very great to see you. Good to see you too. And hopefully Bye. in real life soon. Hopefully in real life soon. 
Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you very Bye. Much. Have a good night. Bye.